Gary's pleasure at beating everyone to the starting gate with new ideas may have been personally satisfying, but it was also risky. By revealing DRI projects, he was also divulging information that could be appropriated by other companies. And this created a unique ethical situation for Gary and his chief competitor. I really believe that on a scale of, of 1 to 10, 10 being ethical, Bill Gates is about a 9. I think that there are some other corporate presidents out there that are about the threes and the fours. I, 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 don't, I don't want to be an apologist for Bill Gates, but, but I'm saying that Gary is just on a different scale. His ethics is a different scale. And what happened is, is Bill used his ethical scale, which was a darn good one. And Gary used his ethical scale, which was a darn good one. Now, the ethics of a businessman are generally one that is that's very, very competitive. And the ethics of, of an academician, although they're certainly competitive, involves a, a much greater degree of cooperation. And so Gary always cooperated. He always said, well, Bill, here's what we're working on. And Bill always said, <laughs> well, that guy sure was a kind of a dummy. He just told me what he's working on. I don't think Gary was a really a, a driven to be a businessman. Um, Gary was driven to create things. and. Uh, he always, every time I talked to him, he had some really great ideas of things he was going to do or things that could be done or things he was working on or new technologies and how he might apply them. That was Gary. This is a beta copy of the very first electronic encyclopedia using optical storage technology. Gary gave it to me one day when we were taping a show in the studio in that building over there. Gary had to use a video disc because CD-ROM technology was not yet widely available. He was very proud of this. This was the first product of his new interactive company, then called ActiVenture. In 1985, Gary showed the very first encyclopedia on a CD-ROM, a project that grew out of his fascination with early video discs. The Grolier Academic American Encyclopedia had many features that are commonplace today, including hypertext links, a full text search engine, and a traditional bookshelf interface. This is the one we need to select, and it's working its way down through the volume here, giving us finer and finer divisions. And finally, we go down and find the article titles, and here they are just as if we were thumbing through that section of the encyclopedia, and we can point to the title okay. we wish to examine. So you're just pulling out that article now. That's right, and here it is, and the, it is. the exploits of Raul Amundsen. At this point, you can page back and forth, take a look at uh -huh. the article, uh -huh. things of that sort. Now, that's all in a CD-ROM that's in this player right here. And, and what, what's the amount of storage involved? How much? Uh, what's well, the this capacity? is 550 megabytes, uh, uh, half a billion bytes of information, enough to stretch uh, 10 characters per inch from uh, here to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's success also gave him time to pursue his love of life. He collected and raced sports cars. An experienced pilot, he owned several airplanes, and he never hesitated to fly to meetings across the state or across the country. I went out to visit uh, Gary, and. Uh, uh, we arranged to meet in the airport in San Jose. Uh, when uh, uh, I got to the airport, uh, he was flying his own private plane in. Uh, so uh, I was meeting him in the terminal for private planes. I went and looked around the airport, no Gary. Uh, or no, there wasn't anyone who looked like a software person wandering around this very small terminal. So I called the company and they said, oh, look for Gary. Uh, he'll have on cowboy boots and has a red beard. I knew I could find him then. And, um, and he still wasn't there, so I looked out the door, the window, and a plane came rolling up. And uh, this fellow with the red beard leaned out the red beard leaned out the window and said, there aren't any parking places, hop in. Gary flew his potential investor to a restaurant near Sacramento and proceeded to describe the future of the PC industry. At that time, um, he was trying to explain what his business was. And I had lunch, and he basically took a paper and outlined uh, the microcomputer industry to me. He explained how the operating system would ultimately control uh, the uh, uh, industry uh, and how application software would run on top of it, and that an operating system company um, should support the application companies, but never have applications, uh, which had turned out to be a fatal mistake, and one of the fatal mistakes for the company. 
Even as Gary's financial success allowed him to accumulate bigger and faster toys, his contemporaries remember him as a man who just enjoyed having fun. Gary had that ability to be innovative. And yet he was, on the other hand, he was, had this amazing free spirit about him. Um, you know, he, Gary was certainly easy to talk into grabbing a six-pack of beer and going out to the lake and water ski. I mean, there was never a problem with that aspect of it either. He was a, a very, uh, very unusual and remarkable individual. The early days of the microcomputer industry created an exciting atmosphere that attracted adventurous entrepreneurs to the PC pioneers working outside of the mainstream mainframe computer world made it more risky but more satisfying. There were very, very few people in those first years who came into the computer industry, who came into the microcomputer industry from the real computer industry. The attitude that, that pervaded Silicon Valley in 1980 was, when are the grown-ups going to come in here and make us stop? That was really what it felt like. Because we could do things that we could do whatever we wanted. CPM's role as the standard operating system for personal computers was not to last very long. When we come back, the battle between CPM and MS-DOS and the true story of what happened with IBM and Bill Gates. Despite his varied talents and accomplishments, Gary Kildall was perhaps best known as the man who chose to go flying on the day IBM came calling. It was the event which dogged him his entire life, and it has become a legend in personal computer history. But his friends and co-workers alike agree that the story is mostly myth, and that the facts are very different. Gary and I were scheduled to go that morning up to meet with Bill Godbout who was one of the early people in the microcomputer industry building an S100 system, and we were delivering him uh, CPM documentation. So Gary and I, as the story goes, were in fact flying. We flew up to the Bay Area, up to the Oakland Airport, delivered the software to Bill, and uh, flew back down and joined the IBM meeting. We were there for the meeting later in the afternoon. By that point in time, things had already gone a little bit wrong. Um, IBM had come into the meeting. They had a uh, what I would call a unidirectional uh, non-disclosure agreement. The idea was that uh, digital research was to agree that they had never met IBM and, and the meeting hadn't occurred, and yet everything that digital research disclosed to IBM was intended to be public domain. That was uh, the way the agreement was structured. IBM also wanted to buy CPM outright for a flat fee and rename it PCDOS, terms that were unacceptable to DRI. IBM then approached Microsoft, and tried to license its clone of CPM called QDOS. When IBM discovered that it might be facing a copyright lawsuit, they returned to DRI and struck a deal. DRI agreed to let IBM sell both CPM and Microsoft DOS side by side, and to let the market decide which was best. But the deck was stacked. I can only tell you that we were quite shocked to see that the price for PC DOS was $40, and the price for CPM 86 was 240. We were given no indication at all whatsoever until it was actually rolled out that they were going to do a six to one price difference. So in fact, um, IBM did let the market decide. It was pretty hard to imagine that uh, somebody could justify buying CPM 86, which had very similar functionality to PC-DOS uh, when there was a six to one price difference. Some industry people have pointed to this incident as a turning point in PC history, and the moment that guaranteed the demise of CPM and the rise of MS-DOS. Others have pointed out that it somehow changed Gary professionally and personally. The frustration that I think more and more